Alright, so good morning or afternoon as the case may be, depending on when you are hitting the play button here on this, the world famous Cotton Companion podcast. Uh, we want to welcome you back uh, to the podcast from wherever you may be tuning in today uh, in the U.S. Cotton Belt from Rolling Fork, Mississippi to Fresno, California and all points in between or outside of those parameters as it may be. Today is Thursday, August 17, and we are... Happy to be dry and have a roof over our head today as it has been raining, it seems like, every single day here in the Mid-South since we came to you last with this podcast, especially uh, the the past couple of weeks. I know some guys are getting too much dang rain out there uh, around here. So I am Beck Barnes. I am the publisher and editor here at Cotton Grower Magazine, and with me, as always, is Cotton Grower Senior Editor, Mr. Jim Stebman. Hello, Jim. Hello, Beck, and hello, everybody. Yeah, we are, uh, as we say, coming to you this morning. We have not discussed it internally, today being August 17. We are looking forward to, on Monday, August 21, this big eclipse, total eclipse of the sun, as it were, uh, that'll be going on during work hours. As I say, Jim and I have not talked about it. we got to figure out our sunglass situation if we're gonna if we're gonna be looking at that thing when it happens here in a few days i have toyed with the idea of doing a joke uh feature and calling up somebody like tyson raper or uh any of these cotton specialists galen morgan over there in texas and asking them what well actually galen wouldn't have to worry about it but what this 22 minutes of lost sunlight is going to do to to these cotton yields here in this uh, growing season, we have to write 1,600 words on, on how that's going to impact these guys. Of course, uh, uh, I guess you could turn it around and say if we made a huge deal out of it, it might actually help uh, prices. Well, you, you never know. I mean, they're already concerned about enough heat units right now. I can only imagine what this might, mos- might possibly do. Yeah, we're, t- yeah, we're talking about <laughs> fewer, less than a half hour of sun- lost sunlight maybe, here. Maybe it'll slow some bug activity, that last-minute bug activity down, too. There you go. Uh, again, if I could just write a big story about it, convince somebody up there on Wall Street uh, or the trade boards that cotton yields are going to suffer nationwide. Maybe we'll see a couple cent uptick uh, in the cotton market. So anyhow, that's that's a, uh, obviously a daydream of mine. Uh, as we speak, though, out there in your actual fields, in real news, uh, we feel like a lot of you guys are entering lay-by uh, are thinking about lay-by, starting to kind of turn your head towards harvest prep. Uh, and so we are going to certainly touch on that a little bit uh, in our uh, epi- every episode discussion of news cotton items that Jim leads us in here. Uh, one of those topics, as always, is going to be prop cr- crop progress, not prop progress. Uh, but we are, as we always do when we come to you during the production season, going to talk about crop progress uh, here shortly. Jim is also planning to tell us about a couple of other topics, including uh, the August WASD report that came out, gave a little bit of a shock to the market. Uh, we're talking about prices here. That thing had a big impact. Uh, you probably have already read a little bit about it, so we're going to bring some context to what has transpired here in the month of August. Finally, uh, we are going to discuss, actually, what do we, we have some merger news with Dow DuPont. Is that correct, Jim? That's true. Yeah, so so I think some late breaking news that just happened before we got in the cotton studio here this morning that he wants to discuss. And finally, we are going to talk about this ongoing saga of dicamba use and uh, regulation here in the Mid-South. There's been a lot moving on that front uh, since we last came to you. So I don't want to put the cart before the horse. We will get to those things on the flip side of our brief musical interlude here. Uh, We're going to dive into those topics. Before we do that, though, I want to give you a quick reminder, as I should be doing, that you would do us a great favor by visiting cottongrower.com slash subscribe. A simple thing to type into your URL bar on your computer the next time you're surfing the web. Type in cottongrower.com slash subscribe and resubscribe yourself to our magazine or to our weekly e-newsletter or to both of those things. You would be doing us a tremendous favor, especially if you like the content that Cotton Grower editors Jim and I 
bring to you uh, almost daily, on a daily basis, fresh original content. So if you support us, we never ask you for your pull out your wallet or anything of that nature. We just want you to tell us who you are and where we can send your magazine or what email inbox we can send our weekly e-newsletter to. So that's enough uh, self-promotion out of me. As I say, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, Jim will be diving into the cotton news items right after this. All right, well, welcome back to the Cotton Companion. We're going to move into the news section of, uh, of the program today, just as usual, starting out with the latest USDA crop progress report. Uh, this will be the, the uh, report uh, that was released uh, for the week through August 13th. Um, at this point, uh, bowl set is uh, nationwide or throughout the cotton belt is setting at 80% at this point. Uh, that's a 22% jump over the past week, uh, and we've got uh, five states that are actually running a little bit ahead of their five-year average on that at this point. Uh, to me, the more significant number right now or to, to, to keep an eye on is uh, our Cotton Bowl's opening report. That, at this point, is now showing 10%. That's a 2% jump in the past week. Uh, again, but there are three states that are really driving that at this point, and there's no surprise. It's Arizona, uh, Louisiana, and Texas, particularly that coastal bend, South Texas area where harvest is already underway. Uh, cotton condition, as we look at it, uh, we're looking at a 61% at this point that are still rated good to excellent, 27% uh, fair, and 12% poor to very poor. When you compare that to the week before, it's a slight increase. We're looking better from the, uh, you know, from the lower side uh, and a little bit better on the higher side at this point. Now, uh, obviously, as Beck mentioned, we've had a lot of rain in the Mid-South. Uh, there are other conditions that are, that are out there right now that could totally impact it. We're sort of in that mixed bag season when we get into, uh, into cotton production. Uh, we've got harvest going on in some areas. We've got harvest prep going on in other areas. Uh, in the Mid-South and the Southeast, we're still battling uh, bollworm and those last gasp of plant bugs at this point. Yeah, I think I saw something about red-banded stink bugs or something. Like right, that. in soybeans. Yeah. In yeah. soybeans. So it's, it's bug season. It's bug season. White fly has just been out off the charts in Georgia and parts of, uh, of the Southeast. Uh, to the point now where they're starting to run into prod product shortages. Uh, the two main products that they primarily use for white fly control are in very, very short supply as of today. And a lot of your entomologists in those areas are saying, move down to your third, fourth, fifth choices on this. Take what you can get and, uh, and get out and, and keep this thing under control. We've got cotton at cutout in some areas, uh, although the university extension guys are say basically saying, keep protecting the crop. we still got a little ways to go at this point. Uh, with all the rain and cloudy weather, there are obviously some concerns over heat units. Uh, again, just rain, rain, and more rain in the Mid-South and, and West Texas. And sadly, a report this week out of New Mexico that uh, a storm came through out there uh, with hail and knocked out 3,000 acres of cotton. Mm. Uh, so obviously that's something that's not reflected in the uh, in the crop progress report because New Mexico I don't believe is included no it's not included in the, in the states that, that USDA watches that's some sooner thing 3,000 in the state of New Mexico is probably around 10 percent of the crop probably. or something that's a that's a significant it's a significant jump, jump yes uh, when you talk about that sp specific <clears throat> state so hate to hear that so anyway it's you know we're down at the point where it's it's really it, it's interesting in the cotton market from our perspective because we're trying our best to keep our eyes and ears on everything that's happening and there is a lot happening in the fields at this point with this crop. So we'll see how uh, how things fan out and or work out here over the next uh, the next week or so. Um, last week was the uh, was the release of the of the monthly WASD report, the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates report, as it were, from USDA. 
and they really threw a curveball into the cotton market last week. Um, and I think really and truly, what what they sh- what they what they report every month are things like U.S. production estimates, uh, forecasts for ending stocks in the U.S., uh, global stock projections, and things like that. I think really and truly the the opening line in the, in the cotton report this week was the one that just really stopped everybody in its tracks, and and anything that came behind it uh, was really of little significance based on this. They're basically saying it's the first survey of U.S. 2017 crop production, this means going out and talking to growers, indicates a crop of 20 and a half million bales, one and a half million above last month, and the largest production in 11 years. I don't believe anybody in the industry was looking at 20 bales as a po- 20 million bales, excuse me, as a possibility for this year. I mean, I go back to uh, go back to early March to the to the Mid South Gin Show and Joe Nicosia's presentation on cotton, hoping that we could get to a point where we could consistently produce 20 million bales by 2020. Yeah, yeah, he's, that was his big, you know, he uses, Joe does, a great <clears throat> dynamic speaker, but he uses these kind of catchy mnemonic devices when he's talking mm-hmm. to help people remember what he's talking about. So I remember his <clears throat> big screen said 20 million bales by 2020, and the implication was <clears throat> that we were going to be on this kind of gradual increase in bales right. produced until we topped out at 20 million in the year 2020, mm-hmm. and now here's this one now here's report <laughs> here in August of 2017 that says we're going to hit it. Now, I, I, I don't want to step on your toes here, but I know that I looked mm-hmm. this up recently for a so, uh, white paper that we were putting together um, for another purpose, and anyhow, I, I went back to 2012 was the last time we planted a comparable apples-to-apples amount of acreage. Mm-hmm. Uh, as we did here in 2017, which was right around, I think we planted 12.1 million bales this year. That year we planted 12.2, something very similar. And we wound up producing a little over 17 million bales right. that year. Right. Granted, I know there was a full-fledged drought on in, in a lot a lot of Texas, sort of the cotton basket of this country. But, you know, what is that 2.5 would be? A quarter of ten million, so it's half of a quarter, which is just twelve percent more cotton this year on a comparable amount of acreage as what we planted in twenty twelve. And I hope I'm not. I see that you've got some outlined <laughs> stuff to discuss there. I hope I'm not stepping <laughs> no, all over no, what you were trying to say. No, not not at all. In fact, what was what was interesting, you know, sadly, it's like the report comes out around noon on uh, you know on on the the report issue day, and in this case, it was August eleventh. And uh, immediately I went over to the, you know, to, to the ICE website and started, you know, monitoring cotton prices. Yeah. And it was, it was really almost predictable how quickly prices dropped based on that report. Uh, in fact, the day ended, they ended up limit down uh, for the day because uh, we, we literally were sitting right around 70, 71 cents when the day started. The report came out and... Uh, Drop down into the high 60s, you know, without without even blinking. Yeah. Now, going back and, you know, our, our good friend Dr. O.A. Cleveland is, uh, you know, does a great job of dissecting all of this and what it really means and and really and truly what he's what he's saying. Other than the fact that USDA is, uh, as he says, is very good at humbling market analysts with their numbers, it's almost like he's taking the Lee Corso not so fast, my friend, approach. To this, as uh, as we move into the market, just try to keep things in perspective at this point. Uh, he says long range weather uh, continues to suggest a U.S. crop below 19 million bales, uh, and, and and quite honestly, we may see another change or adjustment in all of these numbers when the September report comes out uh, here in a few weeks. Uh, after, after that eclipse wreaks havoc. Yes, after the eclipse wreaks total havoc. <laughs> on, on, on the, the mid-south yield yeah. and uh, southeast <clears throat> yield numbers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what he's basically saying is just sort of sit back and relax and, you know, don't don't put a whole lot of stock in this yet. Uh, if that number comes back up in September, then there's going to be some, the market's going to make some serious adjustments. Right now he's saying December should hold within the 65, 69 cent range. I checked this morning, we're sitting at 66.8. 
cents for December uh, for December cotton. Uh, world carryover, other numbers across the world, really at this point don't mean that much because you know it's it's just moving numbers from one column to another uh, right now. But I think uh, one thing to keep in mind is we're still months away, several months away from the peak ginning season. I realize gins are running in parts of South Texas at this point, but for the majority of the cotton belt, you know, we're still trying to get a crop matured and, and, and ready to pick. Uh, as he says, OA says, the historical average deviation between the August estimate and the final estimate when we get to the end of the season is usually about 1.8 million bales. Uh, so many of the people in the industry are feeling like the number we saw uh, from USDA this month is definitely going to be the highest of the season. So we're, you know, from a market perspective, uh, we, we would certainly like that to be, uh, to be true at this point. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be looking at, uh, if, if they come back in September with, uh, you know, with numbers that are still right around the 20 million range, uh, or if that number's still out there, uh, there's some concern that the, the prices could slip back down into the 62, 63 cent level. But uh, right now it's sort of like just uh, sit back, relax, keep doing what you need to do to get this, this, uh, this year's crop squared away, and uh, we'll let the acreage and, and the market settle itself out. Uh, we don't know yet what abandonment numbers are going to look like. Uh, and it, in this case, when we talk about abandonment numbers in Texas, it's usually based on not enough rain. Uh, this year, it may be based on too much in some areas. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Mother, <laughs> Mother Nature will have a say. So. No, oh, she always does. No need to be chicken little no. looking at those production <clears throat> numbers here in mid-August, no. early August when they came out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Excuse me. Moving ahead. Just a quick note, I think the last time we, we visited, we talked about uh, the Justice Department. It kind of cleared the way for Dow and DuPont to, uh, to get things finalized. Uh, and literally within the past week, uh, we've gotten in the news that uh, this DuPont-Dow merger into a new company called Dow DuPont is going to be complete by, by the end of this month. Uh, it's, everything's going to close on the deal uh, uh, when the New York Stock Exchange closes on August 31st. Because uh, at that point, shares of Dow and shares of DuPont stock will cease trading. And on September 1st, shares of Dow DuPont will be start trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, if you follow that and you're looking for the stock ticker symbol, it will be DWDP. Uh, so it looks like uh, this deal is done. Uh, everything is still on on schedule to uh, for the intended three spin-off companies uh, under the Dow DuPont umbrella to uh, to be set and ready to go here within the next 18 months so uh, a lot of things to keep an eye on but it looks like two of the three big mergers are now uh, are now done deals the other being Bear Monsanto it's a done deal well, Bear Monsanto excuse me is not a done deal Kim China Syngenta okay. is done. That's what I was thinking. Well, we just know that, obviously, we are watching Bayer Monsanto closely, too, to see what happens specifically with these cotton brands, cotton seed brands, and, mm -hmm. and technology brands, and, and everything else that will be a part of the sort of fall, not fallout, so it's a little probably too negative of a term, but uh, ramifications that come from that specific merger. Right, right. Uh, the last topic I want to touch briefly on, because we do have some information later in the program, an interview with uh, uh, with Dr. Jason Norsworthy at the University of Arkansas, uh, is to kind of a, a quick update on what's new in the dicamba issue. Uh, I met with uh, Dr. Norsworthy at the uh, Northeast Arkansas Extension and Research Center in uh, in Kaiser. Uh, earlier this week, he, they were doing a, he and uh, Tom Barber and Bob Scott, the other weed scientists for the university, have been doing a lot of studies this summer uh, to try to determine what all of the issues and all the complications and all the factors involved in, uh, in this whole dicamba situation. And some of the results are, are very, very interesting. Uh, 
again, just sort of a, a quick recap. This is not just a Mid-South slash Cotton Belt issue. This is now moved into the Midwest. Uh, and all of these weed scientists out of the Mid-South are talking to each other. They're also talking to their colleagues up in Minnesota and Ohio and Illinois uh, who are now starting to see some issues in, uh, in soybeans in those areas. Uh, I saw a report yesterday, someone was estimating that basic, roughly 3.1 million acres of soybeans have now been impacted in some shape, form, or fashion by what appears to be movement of dicamba onto, uh, onto those crops. And as Larry Steckel, our good friend at, at University of Tennessee says, there are two things about this technology that are very clear across all of the geographies. First, the Extendamax and Ingenia and uh, Infexapan products that are out there, the low volatility products, are really, really good tools for pigweed control. They have worked well yes. in the fields. And I would say for the vast majority of growers, they have things have gone smoothly. The product has worked with very little complication. Steckel, I, I spoke <clears throat> with Steckel last week at a field day. Was it last week? Could have been two weeks ago now. But he told me that in terms of efficacy of the product, <clears throat> pigweed control is in better shape this year than it has been, I think he told me, in the past 12 years. Right. He said it's, it's the best it's been mm -hmm. uh, in at least a decade Right. when you talk about pigweed. And, and that's saying something because here in Tennessee, mm -hmm. about, you know, what, how long ago? Six years ago or so, we had some fields that you couldn't get a picker through. Right. I mean, just eating up. You could barely walk into yeah. them. And in fact, his quote, <clears throat> I remember I wrote a story about this, so I like have a picture of his quote that I transcribed was, you, you can't scoff that. You can't scoff at that. You can't downplay that. That's, right. That is a big deal that should not be ignored. Oh, yeah, Abs so. absolutely. You know, but, but also in, in the fact of saying, yes, it is a great, it's a great tool and it has worked beautifully as it's supposed to. The second thing he says, it's clear that we're struggling to keep these products in the field. Yeah. That there is, uh, there is there are some volatility issues out there. And that really was the crux of a lot of the, 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 uh, the studies that have been done in, in Arkansas this summer. Uh, just to summarize, because uh, the weed scientists have really have done uh, a great job in presenting, developing and presenting this. And when I talked to them last week, I you know, basically walked up and, and said, uh, guys been doing anything this summer? And uh, uh, the response I basically got was, uh, you know, just sort of like that slow eye roll and, uh, you know, and the fact that they don't want to, they don't want to ever hear the, the, uh, the word dicamba again hopefully by the time they finish all of this but to summarize quickly and all of this is you can find on our website at, at cottongrower.com uh, in their studies this summer they found that uh, every dicamba formulation that they looked at and this includes older dicamba formulations and the new low volatility formulations have demonstrated volatility in the field uh, to the point where some of them could continue to, to volatilize at least 36 hours after application and move from target site in spite of following the label to the T and it, to every word and, and, and requirement involved. Uh, they said lab testing found Ingenia, Extendamax, and Fexapan to be obviously less volatile than the older formulations like Banville Clarity, but in a field setting where volatility measurements are based on soybean injury, differences in volatility between the older products and the newer products are not that evident. Uh, soybeans are so sensitive basically you're saying that very, 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 very low levels of volatility can cause injury. So then the quest raises the question, what's what's causing the problem. Um, one of the things that they're looking at is, uh, or their, their confidence they've confirmed is that under conditions in, particularly in the Mid-South or during the summer, uh, conditions where they spray, you had warm conditions, you had temperatures 90 to 98 degrees, and you had soil temperatures of 100 to 110 degrees. And even though the applications have been made with the correct boom height and the correct nozzles and things, 
when you have a soil temperature that high, the product appears to be volatilizing off the soil. So even though the application is made correctly, the material can still get up and move. Uh, it's obviously not the volatilization and wind they've discovered are not the only means of movement. Uh, the dicamba can move on dust particles on roads that run through treated fields. And you know, as you're driving your pickup truck down these, these dusty roads between that, that dry out quickly between all the rain we've had, uh, the particles can move from, from the roads and field edges over into, into other crops. Um, it's, it's an interesting study. Uh, I don't know that it certainly has, has answered all of the question, but uh, I think it's going to go a long way toward looking at what's going to have to be done. Adjustments are going to have to be made as we move into, uh, into, the, next, uh, into the next crop season. Uh, and the second year of this this label from EPA on these products. Uh, the interview I did with Jason Norsworthy, I think he, he does a great job in explaining a lot of this and, uh, and some of the concerns, but also again pointing out the value of the technology. So uh, obviously they're big fans of it, they would love for it to be able to work in this area, we just have to figure out a way to make it all make it all come together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, rather than summarize uh, Jason's thoughts on this thing, we do have, as Jim alluded to earlier, a nice interview that Jim conducted. It was a good get that Jim conducted with uh, Jason Norsworthy because this is such a hot button topic. We know so many of you are interested in it. And um, yeah, this news that they were talking about, uh, what was it, last week that you spoke with Jason? It was earlier this week. Earlier this week. Earlier so this all week. of my days run together, as you know, Jim. Um, so anyhow, good news to get. Good, uh, good interview that he, Jim, will be bringing to you here uh, on the flip side of this music break. Assuming that you were you wrapped up here. We're wrapped up. Okay, good. So, so on that note, let us bring you this interview that Jim has conducted with Jason Norsworthy about dicamba. On the flip side of this music break, stick with us and we will be right back. Welcome back to the Cotton Companion. Uh, I'm sitting here at the Northeast Arkansas Research uh, Experiment Station in uh, in. Kaiser, Arkansas, or Kaiser, Arkansas, uh, visiting with Dr. Jason Norsworthy, who's a professor of weed science with uh, with the university. Jason, welcome to the Cotton Companion. Glad to be here. Um, obviously, it's been a uh, it's been quite a summer for you folks. Uh, we've been talking about the dicamba issue now for for several months on our podcast and in, and on our website. Uh, obviously, it's been a topic of conversation all across the Mid South and now moving into the Midwest. Uh, it's uh, and I know you and, and and your weed team here with Tom Barber and, and and Bob Scott have also spent most of the summer looking for some of the answers. Uh, what have you found so far as 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 we move in, as we're moving ahead into uh, through the season and looking ahead to next season? You know, as we take a look back on, on this season and what we've been able to show, I guess within the last or find within the last few weeks or, or month now is really to just to understand the volatility potential of the products that we have out there. And of course in the state of Arkansas, Ingenia was a product uh, this year, and but we've also been looking very closely at Extendamax. And uh, what we have seen is that we have two products here that while there might be a reduction, a slight reduction in, in volatility, at least in the uh, the greenhouse and humidomes, but when we go to the field, we haven't seen the benefit of the volatility reduction in the field, similar to what has occurred in the lab. And with that, we're seeing off-target uh, movement in our research. and. We also have gone back and it appears that the number of acres sprayed with these products, there appears to be a pretty strong correlation with the areas treated versus the, the amount of off-target issues that, that we ultimately have this year. Okay. Um, obviously, there's a lot, still a lot of interest in this based on the, uh, on the size of the crowd that you had here today and, and have, uh, have been talking to for the last couple of weeks. Um, what kind of reactions are you hearing from, from growers and other people in the industry based on these studies? 
You know, it, the first reaction I'd say, and not necessarily based on these studies, but just the reaction as, as a whole is there's the industry is, is split on this, and it's, mm -hmm. it's a very divided industry. And it's um, actually I've, uh, my comment back to that is in probably the 20 years that I've been now professionally uh, working, it uh, I've never seen anything that has divided agriculture to the extent that that this has. And the individuals that have used the technology have been very impressed uh, with the weed control. We have a lot of a lot of clean fields and. And uh, we've we've sprayed multiple applications of Ingenia, and as I talked to colleagues in other states where Extendamax have been has been used, and as well as Extendamax in our research plots, uh, multiple applications appear to be uh, quite effective in terms of dealing with dealing with pigweed. So those growers are those growers are happy. Those growers have a crop that obviously isn't damaged this year, and mm -hmm. uh, for that reason, they're going to have a, a very profitable year. Our growing conditions here in Arkansas, Northeast Arkansas, Big Hill, Missouri, West Tennessee has been exceptional in looking at uh, possibly a record crop in areas in which we don't have damage. But then you have the other individuals that have experienced damage and they're wanting to know why was their why was their crop damaged? What was the cause of the damage? And uh, again, who's going to ultimately compensate them for that damage? And and like I said, with that, it's been a very, very uh, tense year and it's one that I'm, I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to bringing to a close. I can I can imagine now as as I recall looking at, at some of the some of the findings or some of the discussions in your study, you know, I think a lot of people are probably going, we want a specific reason on what's happened and that's not necessarily the case, correct? Well you know, yes, in, in terms of specific, I think it, it does differ from from field to field or differs from geography and but having having said that I think that uh, come back to what I said is it's really the, the more you spray the greater the the risk is associated with that and what we have been able to show is we do know under what I would call normal summer conditions summer conditions June July uh, conditions that we do know that extendamax as well as volatility uh, extendamax as well as ingenia will tend to volatilize in those conditions and once you have volatilization you can spray a product today and it can volatilize tomorrow and get hung up in an inversion and with that it begins to disperse over vast acres so we have a been to fields we've been to fields this year in in areas of the state which there was very little spraying and you can easily pinpoint physical drift in certain areas i've actually witnessed some tank contaminations that have occurred but when we look at northeast arkansas as a whole it's really the fact that we've sprayed a lot of acres and, and we're, the data would indicate at this point we've had what I call atmospheric loading where we've had material that has volatilized off and, and with that you have vast damage across, uh, across fields and, and symptomology from turn row to turn row that doesn't really differ across that field. Mm -hmm. I know obviously we've seen reports not only from Arkansas and other states in the Mid-South but also we're starting to see some, some comments and reports out of the Midwest. Uh, are you coordinating with with some of your colleagues in, in these other states and if so in what way? You know yes I mean we definitely uh, we have open dialogue with, between colleagues and uh, we'll text on a regular basis or on occasion exchange emails exchange exchange phone calls and uh, mm -hmm. you know the uh, I've had also the opportunity to be in some of these these states and I'd be the first to tell you that probably Northeast Arkansas similar to what the numbers say Northeast Arkansas is probably hit Northeast Arkansas Boot Hill Missouri and West Tennessee's hit harder than any other area, but these areas are, are, are the heavier users of mm -hmm. uh, the dicamba technology. But no, when you, you've been in southern Illinois, I've actually been in, in Minnesota, and, and the damage is not unique uh, just to the, the south. The, the damage really lagged behind, but when you think about from an application standpoint, uh, they were definitely two, three, four weeks behind us in terms of spraying. So a lot of their reports really got going uh, within the last two to three weeks in terms of issues that they that they dealt with but the other thing also you get into is it's really it's not only it's the planning of the technology but like I say it's the spraying of the technology so you may have the comment is well there's 20 million acres that's here in the US but the question really should be how many of those 20 million acres are ultimately sprayed because where you have at least what we've seen where we have high spraying that's what translates into uh, ultimate damage okay I know when uh, when these technologies were approved late last year, um, USDA basically put a two-year label in place on it. I'm sure they've been watching the the situation this year and 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 
seeing what's going on. Um, as we move ahead through the rest of this year and into early next year, getting ready for next season, what kind of adjustments, uh, what kind of, of things are we going to be uh, having to look at or, or maybe put in place uh, moving ahead? You know, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm not the one to, to answer that. I think we've got, we have failure of some products that we thought were going to perform a certain way, and unfortunately they have not in terms of rectifying that. You know, the state of Arkansas has put together a dicamba task force. They uh -huh. have the pesticide committee, Arkansas State Plant Board, and it's really the state's responsibility to develop regulations around that. And I know the EPA, I've been, of course, part of several EPA uh, phone conversations, and the EPA is quite some concerned about this, but what is the EPA going to do for 2018? I, I'm not going to venture to, to speculate, but there is a lot, there's a lot of task force committees that are being formed at this point, and not only in Arkansas, but nationally and in other states to mm -hmm. try to take a look at this and try to understand what is the path forward for 2018. Okay. Great. Jason, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thanks and, a lot. Uh, and we will uh, we'll be right back with more of the Cotton Companion. So all right, that's going to just about do it for this, the 30th installment of the Cotton Companion podcast. The Cotton Companion has moved into middle age. Uh, we are doing a, <laughs> we are doing a new subscription drive. Uh, as you may have noticed, uh, if you have visited any of our various and sundry cotton grower platforms recently, we are just trying to encourage you all, if you consume our uh, content that we put out. To go ahead, tell us who you are and subscribe to our magazine and to our e-newsletter. Uh, you would be doing us a great favor to do so. If you want to do that, simply go to cottongrower.com slash subscribe, and you can subscribe to any of our uh, uh, platforms there. For now, we want to thank you sincerely for joining us. If you like what you're hearing, by all means, tell your farmer buddies about us. You guys are our greatest uh, marketing tool. We know that you all talk with your buddies. We know that you have a uh, coffee in the mornings before you get out and start your day at your various coffee spots. Tell your buddies if they want to know, hey man, how come you are so well informed about everything about cotton? Say, well, I listen to Jim Stedman and Beck Barnes on the Cotton Companion podcast. You would be doing us a great favor. If they then say, how can I get a hold of that podcast? You tell them three easy ways. The first, go to cottongrower.com. Type in the search bar at the top of the homepage, Cotton Companion, and uh, when you click that little magnifying glass, it will take you to a landing page that has each of our 30 uh, now podcast episodes listed by topic that you can uh, search for whatever topic you'd like to hear about. The second way to, to get a hold of our podcast is to subscribe to our channel on iTunes. That's the way that I listen to our podcasts. If you have a smartphone, you're familiar with your uh, I, iPhone. Uh, you're familiar with the iTunes app, uh, you can go ahead, subscribe to our channel there on the podcast app. Leave us a rating if you've done that. Let us know what you think of how we're doing. You could give us five stars. You could give us four stars. Whatever you think of us, let us know. We, we are always all ears when it comes to constructive we'll, criticism. We'll take five eclipses. Five this, eclipses. This time, yes. That's right. That's right. Uh, another great way to be sure that you can receive each installment of the Cotton Companion, in my opinion, the best way is to sign up to our weekly Cotton Grower e-newsletter. Jim here works hard to pack that thing with all the relevant news of the day and uh, gets them out. They hit your email inbox like clockwork every Tuesday morning. Occasionally, they will hit your email inbox on Thursday mornings as well during the production season. You can do that, again, by simply going to www.cottongrower.com slash subscribe. From there, it's very user-friendly and intuitive. You, can, you too, can receive the CG e-newsletter. Very cool item. Also, make sure you're following us on social media. On Twitter, we are at Cotton Grower Mag. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching for Cotton Grower Magazine in the Facebook search bar. Uh, you won't regret doing that. It's the best way to keep up with all of our uh, online content. We hope that you are enjoying our latest issue. At this point, that is the... 
August September. August September has that. Which should, no. it should be hitting mailboxes within the next uh, week. Here, no, yes, here very soon at the very first of September, I believe, mm-hmm. is when you guys will be getting our August September issue. Got a lot of good items in there, uh, including a, a our cover feature on a uh, very cool. Uh, California cotton growing operation got a great dicamba update in that one as well you won't want to miss it look in your mailboxes here in the next week or two to find it this podcast is produced by Mr. Marcus Antonelli he works at the mothership Meister Media Worldwide in beautiful Willoughby Ohio my name is Beck Barnes and I will be back with you in two weeks on the next episode of the Cotton Companion podcast for now on behalf of my own cotton companion Mr. Jim Stedman We wish you and your operation all the best.